Welcome, everyone, to another week on The Football Show. I'm your host, David Barbash, at the Global Sports Channel. We have two fantastic guests today. We have Darren McCauley, one of the footballers who I've... My, in fact, not only do uh, I have the pleasure of speaking with him for the first time, but my brother has known him when he played in the Northern Ireland Leagues over there with Cole Rain. We'll get into that in a little bit. And Mike Sutton, who owns the Auckland Huskies, one of the co-owners there, and is a lifelong fan of Arsenal in the EPL. Uh, I have to, we get, before we get started, Darren, I wanted to ask you, uh, your, um, of the English Premier League teams, your favourite team? I'm United. I've grown up a Manchester United fan, so I'm sure Mike won't be happy at that. Um, so yeah, Man United. Well, you'll 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 be very happy uh, um, after today's results in the FA Cup. And uh, I wasn't uh, saying the most hospitable and kind things when Leeds played Manchester United. I think we just lost Darren. You want to maybe pause? Okay. We lost Darren for a minute. Welcome back, Darren. Thanks, yeah, I'm David. sure you were really happy uh, when uh, Leeds United uh, were demolished by your team 6-2. It could have been 10-2 at some point. Yeah, it's it's great. Um, Leeds have always been conceding goals this year. When you watch a Leeds game, it's always exciting. There's always goals at either end. Um, so whenever the whenever our strikers get flowing, um, there's no stopping them. Yeah, and I think earlier in the in the season you were still trying to find out what lineup worked really well and try to get that chemistry. And I think the best signing, bar none, has been Bruno Fernandes because I think he's been an absolute revelation. Uh, and I think probably the best signing, you know, def definitely the last transfer window. I thought he was the best signing. So Bruno Fernandes. What a difference. And of course, having healthy Marcus Rashford, getting Edison Cavani signed as well because that rotation and having some of the youngsters that you've got coming through. Um, I think Manchester United, um, I think right now, along with City, probably the hottest form in the Premier League right now, based on the last six or seven games, you know? Definitely. I think Fernandez has been arguably the best player in the Premier League. I think he's got four Player of the Month awards in a row, which is some kind of record. Um, when he first came over, I was I was unsure about him because of his size, but his technical ability, his assists, um, his crossing, his passing, he's just been outstanding. And without him, I, we wouldn't be where we are in the league right now. Um, and like you said, if you get that consistent Man United team, like if you get Rashford firing on all cylinders, Martial is starting to look a lot more comfortable. Yes. Cavani's came in, and I think that's been key as well. They have someone with such a high profile um, pushing the younger players. And also, I think Luke Shaw having a, having a consistent left back and, and not chopping and changing the team because we haven't had a consistent team for years. That's how it feels. But now it feels as if you're looking at Man United team and you can kind of know who's on the team sheet already. And it's been a long time since we've been able to say that. I think you're right. And uh, I want to sort of throw that over to, to Mike, because if you look at the strength of Manchester United in the last few games, is that consistency, having that rotation, having the consistent starters, getting that chemistry together. And I think what's hurt Mike's team in terms of Arsenal is you haven't necessarily had that consistency. You've had rotation. Now, you know, you're playing in, in Ketia, of course, starting him because of the FA Cup. But Lacazette and also Lacazette and Aubameyang haven't had that goal-scoring form that previously they've had. And then they had the injuries and then they had the red cards. So, Mike, before we get into the FA Cup, do you think that consistency, is it been injuries? Has it been lack of consistency with Arsenal so far? Yeah, well, I think, to be fair... Um, we're missing one key player, and that's the VAR. But um, yeah. you know, that, that's the consistent player that United have every week. Um, <laughs> the VAR. <laughs> um, uh, I heard a joke the other day that you know 
that uh, Ollie was going in, all in for uh, for a January transfer, and that was another VAR. But anyway, um, <laughs> and look, if you're happy playing park the bucks, park the bus, and counter attacking football as United do, then you know that that's fine too. I'm sure Darren's very happy where they're sitting on the on the on the ladder. And that's all that matters, really. Um, and no, in all seriousness, I think you know clearly they do play a different style United now, or the, since the Ferguson days, probably. Um, but that's okay. They've got to evolve. Uh, United, um, you know, Arsenal. If you if your key scorers aren't scoring, you've got problems. You know, and and that's the issue we've faced with Aubameyang. Like, who would have thought that coming into this year? I mean, he's got a few, but then he went on a dry spell, and yeah. that's where he dropped all the points. So, if you're not scoring, you're not winning. You know, the consistency and all of the rest of the play goes out the window. The managers start doubting themselves. They chop and change and get some injuries and. Before you know it, you're 10 games of a really bad run of form. And I think to some degree, yeah. Arsenal have lost their way with that and, and they're learning with Mikel, but um, yeah, that's football. It is. And I think when you go through those rough spells like a Leeds or an Arsenal, because Leeds and Arsenal have had some of those same patches through the you know, season so far. Leeds currently last three haven't scored a goal, have given up a bunch you know, 3-0 th- to Crawley Town. I mean, 3-0 to Crawley Town, 3-0 to Spurs. Embarrassing lately. Um, however, Leeds uh, have scored a lot more goals than Arsenal. I think that's, you brought up a good point, Mike. The goals that you think of players like Aubameyang and Lacazette, and especially Aubameyang, you would think that's 15 to 20 goals a year guaranteed, guaranteed. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's usually 20, but yeah, he's guaranteed usually 15 to 20. And uh, a poor start. And I think you've had the lack of discipline uh, has been shocking because what was it? It was, uh, what was it? Five red cards mm. in the first, something like maybe 10 games? Yeah. I think that comes from frustration though, because you can see, okay, um, you know, some of the players on the red cards have, have a bit of form there, but I think that really comes from frustration that they know what they want to do. They're not yeah. executing. They're making some mistakes or a teammate's letting them down. And those guys that have that shorter fuse, it's it's coming out, unfortunately, a bit bit un, unprofessional. Um, I, but I will say, I think we would be in a much worse position if we didn't have uh, Leno. And I think yeah. he's been a real find at the back. And then we need a couple of generals, you know, as you've seen with Van Dyke at Liverpool, United are starting to get it now. City have had it for a long time. At Chelsea, you've got it. Um, you know, Leicester have got it. When you see those generals at the back with a good goalkeeper, it makes all the difference in the world to, to the midfield and therefore the rest of the team. Yeah, because it's it's funny. You you brought up this is interesting because Manchester United's strength, if you look at the stats, and going back to Darren on this one, is they might be in first place right now. But they've given up 25 goals. If you look, I'm looking at the top six right now. In sixth place, Everton's only given up seven goals for the year. Tottenham in fifth, 16. Liverpool, 15. Leicester, 14. 13 goals given up in 18 games played because Man City's played one less than Manchester United. And there's a big gap there. You've given up 25 goals, but you've scored 36. And I think, for me, yes, I agree with what you're saying, Mike. You need to have that the marshals that, going back in the day, you had literally Lee Dixon and some of the guys that you've had, Tony, Tony and Lee, that partnership at the back, that's hard to find. You look at the uh, the teams under Alex Ferguson and you think about the tough guys at the back. We're talking like they will take your legs out. It's the same as Leeds in the 1970s under Don Revy. Having those generals at the back, that is your foundation. And I think with Van Dyke missing for Liverpool, it's been massive. Because today, if you look at the games in the FA Cup today, the game against Manchester United, the vulnerability of Liverpool on those long balls over the top. 
that they're like deers in the headlights where Van Dyke was such a great reader of the game. And if he didn't even get to it, he could marshal somebody over to cover it. He's a great director, just like Bruno Fernandes being a great director in midfield. So let's jump into the, this week. The first game up actually was an EPL game on Thursday, and that was the Liverpool game. And the shock of the week for me was Liverpool losing 1-0 to Burnley. Shocking. 72% possession for Liverpool. 16 shots on goal, six on target, and only four shots on target for Burnley. And no goals from open play by Burnley, but Burnley wins because of a penalty in the 83rd minute, taken by one of my favourite strikers, Ashley Barnes. When he's on, he's good. When he's off, he's absolutely terrible. Um, but what, what I wanted to get your take, both of you individually, I'll start off with Mike and then go to Darren, your take on what is it right now at Liverpool? Is it the injuries? Is it the inconsistency of a team constantly having to rotate because of the demands of the, the, uh, the scheduling? What is it? And I'm going to go put, put it over to you, Mike, about the loss of Liverpool and what's the problem right now? Yeah, well, I think Van Dyke, we all talk about him, everyone knows him as for his defensive qualities, but I think you've really got to look at what he has in that team. And it's the incisive forward passing and, and leading to positive play and attacking play and goals that they're really missing. Um, clearly, the defensive um, lack with him not there is plain to see. But what he gives, the, the confidence he gives to the midfielders and the attackers, the Sullers and the Mane's and those guys who know if they're in the right spot, they're going to get a ball on their toes from, from Van Dyke from 30 metres away. That, that, I think, is one key factor. Um, I don't think any club would cop the, the you know, excuse to have a heavy fixture. They've all got that. Liverpool have one of the heaviest. Yeah. So, yes, it's a factor, but I don't think they'd accept that as, as an excuse. I think they're just not finishing. You know, they're doing the similar things. If you look at the um, their fullbacks are doing, still doing a lot of carrying a lot of the low, getting down the wings and doing the crosses. Yep, yep you're the right. Crosses into the box, but they slightly. If you look at that game from Burnley, the crosses are in the wrong position. You know, if you've got a a, um, a really good defensive structure and you're pushing the ball forwards into the defensive line, can just hold still and it's an easy clearance. If you're getting in behind and crossing, pulling it back from the byline, that's where they've done all their damage in the past and they're just not doing it. It's just those little things, I think. Um, plus, if the guys get on a run of form, I mean, they're back, aren't they? You know, so... Yeah, so I, I do agree with you. Um, what I thought was the Diego Yotta, when they were looking stronger about maybe eight to nine games ago, and they were on that run of starting to move back up. Um, Diego, Diego Yotto, to me, was the second best signing outside Bruno Fernandes. That was my opinion. When he went out injured, um, I thought, gosh, you know, what are they going to do right now? And I don't think they've been the same in midfield. Yes, you're right. They're too reliant on Andy Robertson. And, and, and Trent Arnold to, put, to provide these from the left or right wings coming back. But Diego, Diego Yotta, some of the runs that he was doing and, and also pulling back and just the, the movement was exceptional. I want to kick it over to Darren to get your take on Liverpool's sort of current run. One win in the last seven games, if we include when we cover the, uh, the, the, the cup game, but one win in seven. What is your take? Yeah, I agree. The the missing Van Dijk um, has been has been crucial to their to their downfall. Like their defensive, the goals that they've conceded, they haven't conceded a lot of goals. But his his, his sheer presence in the team, um, he exudes confidence. You you watch him and he exudes calm. Um, when those balls are floated over the top, he's able to control them with ease. I know the young guy who came in. Um, earlier on in the season. I've seen him struggle a few times running towards his own goal. I can't remember his name, but he has that, that ponytail. And, and also, as Mike says, his distribution towards the forward line is outstanding. He can play 60, 70-yard balls 
under the toe of Mane and Liverpool are counter-attacking at a high speed. Um, and like you said, David, missing Jota has been really bad for Liverpool. He came in at the beginning of the season and he was like a world beater. He, I looked at him and thought, he's this guy's going to be like a top, top striker. Uh, it talked ar around the same uh, sentences as Salah and yes, Mane. Yes. And, and so when he went missing as well, you would expect that Mane and Salah would produce the goods because they're world-class players. Um, but they probably haven't delivered the high standards that they expect. Um, so that's been two of the key issues that I can see from afar. Um, but at the same time, once Mane and Salah do get going and do get a few goals under their belt, like I think the floodgates will open. But that reliance on Van Dijk and Jota, and especially Jota because he's a new signing, um, too much reliance on them uh, has probably been to their detriment. And do you think rotation has hurt them? Or do you think it's underperforming uh, of the players that are usually up here? Do you think it was earlier in the season they had so many injuries that you think some of them that have come back from injuries haven't resumed the level of play that they were at before? Absolutely, and that's to be expected. Rotation always hurts teams. If you have a consistent 11 and you know who's playing, then you'll have a successful team. But if a player is coming back from injury, it's going to take him maybe four or five games, 90-minute games, to get back up to the level where he was previously at. So if you've got five or six players coming back into that environment where they need time to adjust, then then it's it's crucial they be in a successful club. But at the same stretch, it's Liverpool Football Club. You should mm -hmm. have a lot of players who, no matter what the situation, are going to be at a high level. Um, but yes, rotating a team never helps. Yeah, and I think um, <clears throat> so. rotation, definitely Van Dijk, and we, Mike and... Yourself, Darren, pointed out that those 60 to 70 yard over the top balls across the field diagonally from Van Dyke, just incredible. And I think that's the great thing about Bruno Fernandes as well. They have, they both have the foresight, different positions, but they have this almost like anticipation of the game. They're almost two steps ahead of players on other teams in the same position. So it's quite amazing. Let's go, let's, let's shift gears a bit because that was the game on Thursday, and then Friday, we only had uh, one game that was Chorley Town against Wolves. It was surprising, believe it or not, they actually finished 1-0 to Wolves, and um, obviously, it's going to be a big dominant possession of, of Wolves, which was 76% possession for Wolves, but I'm actually surprised. Nine shots on goal for Chorley Town versus only two shots on goal for Wolves. Only one on target, but that was all they needed. So Vitor Machado Ferreira scored in the 12th minute. Um, they did change things. And, and I wanted to ask, um, have you played in um, some of the cup games before? You mentioned, I know, some of the derby games, but have you played in any of the cup games yourself, Darren? Like cup games in my career? Yeah, in, in your in your career. Have you played in any of the cup games where maybe yeah. uh, changes were rung by the, you know, the manager? Yeah, yeah. Every season we play cup games. So you've you've got the league, obviously, and then you've usually got two cups that run alongside that, similar to the EPL. You've got the EPL, the FA Cup, the Carling Cup, it used to be called. So you've got a similar structure in, in Ireland um, and here in Australia. Um so the cup games, if you're playing an underdog, you can't really win because if you won, you're expected to win. And if you lose, you get egg on your face. <laughs> so um, you have to take them really seriously. And you have to, if you get an early goal, then that can really set the tone for the rest of the game because the early goal gives the impression to the other team that, all right, well, we are we're below this team and now that they've scored early that cements that mentality 
Whereas if the game goes for first half, they, you get through the first half and it's nil nil. You get the 60 minutes and it's nil nil. You get the 75 and it's nil nil. The team starts gaining more and more confidence the more the time. So I would say that the early goal is vital in, in killing off a cup tie. In, in this case for Wolves, it, it, it did kill it off, but I am definitely surprised. Uh, Wolves did start up front, Patrick Catrone, and I hadn't seen him start up front for them so far. So um, I know Leeds are trying to get uh, Adama Traore, and I think he's a bull. I think um, if Leeds got him, I think it would really benefit Leeds to having somebody of his strength and pace. But Wolves are through to the next round. Saturday kicked off, and the first game was on Saturday, believe it or not, was not the FA Cup game, but it was Aston Villa who has to make up a couple of games. They were playing host to Newcastle United. I'm a fan of Aston Villa. I'm a fan of Dean Smith. Um, Ollie Watkins, I think he's a young talent up front. I wanted to get your take on Aston Villa. They won 2-0. Um, they had 11 shots on goal, five on target, only one shot on target for Newcastle. Newcastle's on a bad run of form. I'll be amazed if Steve Bruce is going to be there much longer. Um, I do like him as a manager. They haven't had a lot of good form up front. Uh, but Ollie Watkins and Aston Villa, that moves them up into eighth place they currently are on 29 points, but they've only played 17. So they could significantly move up as high as third place. Wanted to get your take on Mike, first Mike and then Darren, on Aston Villa. Um, young, exciting squad. Up front, you've got Ollie Watkins. Uh, you do have Jack Grealish, another young, uh, exciting, uh, attacking midfielder. Uh, what's your take? on Aston Villa so far for the season. A bit up and down for me. Yeah, look, a bit up and down, but I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. You know, they've, they've got a bit of the Leeds mentality of they're young, they're aggressive, they're trying things, they're backing themselves. You know, it's, it's the innocence of youth in that sense that they're, they're not scarred by, by a, a, you know, a long career. So they're just going out and having a go. And I think Jack Grealish is, is clearly a world talent. Um, yeah. Obviously, Ollie Watkins as well. I think if they get a bit more of that work ethic that you see in Leicester and you're now seeing in West Ham, um, where they're toughening up a bit, they're 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 you know they're they're having, having a good season for them, given where they were a couple of years ago. And if they keep pushing and keep letting the kids play like that with a bit more solidity, I think they'll um, you know, they're 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 a dark horse to be in the top six or eight by the end of the season, I think for sure. Um, you know, I think he touched on it, but but Newcastle. Uh, are in a horrible place at the moment, Oof. and, and that sort of certainly helps Aston Villa going there. Um, or was it was that Newcastle, wasn't it? Pardon my yeah, yeah. So was it? it was Aston yeah. Villa at home to Newcastle, Aston and Villa, um, yeah. Yeah. so you know, I think that if if um if Aston Villa can keep letting the the, the, the younger guys and the talent, talents emerging, like Bielsa does at, at Leeds, um, then I think that uh, you know, there's a lot of promise there. Great. And, and what, what do you think uh, about that promise, Darren? Um, from your perspective, listen, striker, winger, I mean, you must love watching this attacking style of Aston Villa. I, I love to watch them. Yeah, I do. Aston Villa, Wolves, Leeds United, they've been a breath of fresh air um, since they've been in the Premier League. Uh, the way they play, the 3-5-2 structure that Villa has, uh, Watkins yep. is an exciting talent. Um, he's fast, he's strong, he's brave. Um, Jack Grealish has come into his own. He looks as if he's a top player now. He, he looks as if he's matured and he's kind of been their talisman and captain. So I think has come coming to prominence. Watkins, um, with his, just his raw talent, his speed, um, his technical ability and the structure of the team. They're really well run. And I, I do, like you said, I like the manager, Dean Smith. He's, um, he seems like a hard man, and but he seems as if he does the right things. Um, and just similar to Wolves and, and Leeds. I know Leeds are a bit careless, but yeah. I, I love watching them. I love the way they play football. It's just so different. 
um, and Wolves as well have just been that the Portuguese, I think he's Portuguese, the manager that they have is um, has brought in uh, the Lex Ruben Neves, players like that of real technical quality that have just been amazing for the Premier League. But yes, Vala, fair play to them. You know, eighth in the league. Um, they're a massive club, a hugely supported club. So if they can get that consistently in the Premier League for a top 10 finish, then that's, that's an, an amazing achievement. Yeah, I agree on, on, on both of your points. Um, I do like, the, I think midway through the season, they started bringing off the bench a lot, El Ghazi. And uh, one of the first games I watched with him, he must have shot on goal like 12 times. And it was one of those games where they had like 16 shots on goal. And I, I, don't, I can't remember if they lost that game. They might have lost that game or, or drawn it. But I was thinking, wow, this guy, just any chance he's got, he's going for it. And, and so having that, getting Ross Barkley back, because I think Ross Barkley was out for a while. Um, I predict that Aston Villa will get in the, maybe creep into the top six by the end of the season. It's a long season. And the way this the way the season's going, I, I've no idea because at one point, the beginning of the season, it was Southampton and Everton were the hottest teams. Manchester City were down here, and now Manchester City are the hottest side. So let's see what happens. But the, we're going to shift gears real quick. On Saturday, the first game in the FA Cup was one of the games going into it, I thought was going to be a great game. And that was Southampton playing host. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about this, Mike, but they were playing host to Arsenal. And Arsenal dominated the possession, 62% possession. But um, not a lot of shots on target for both sides. Only two shots on target for both sides. Nine shots on goal for Southampton. Seven shots on goal for Arsenal. Now, I wanted to ask... You, Mike, um, interesting setup. Um, he chose to go with Martinelli and one of my favourites when he spent his loan time with Leeds United, the young, exciting Eddie Enketia. Um, Did you agree with the setup of Arsenal, the formation, putting Saka and Lacazette on the bench, keeping Louise and Chambers on the bench, or did you agree with the setup because it's an FA Cup game? Um, well, I don't agree with it because they lost. Yep. <laughs> so I think that, uh, you know, I think they're a little bit caught in between Arsenal. They're not quite sure whether they're, they're trying to rebuild their, their Premier League aspirations. They, they're going to put all their money on Europa or, you know, they're going to go again at the FA Cup. And I think if they run a form solid, you don't have to make too many changes to give a couple of key guys a rest. But I think he's he's kind of, he seems to be sort of stuck between what the strategy is. Um, not the playing style, but the overall club intention for the year. Exactly. And I, I think that's been sharpened up now because no more FA Cup. But I mean, at, at the same token, the FA Cup traditionally sees a bit of experimentation and, and some, you know, giving bench players or squad players some solid time. And they need that. Um, but I think the strategy was clearly wrong because we didn't win. I mean, that's at the end of the day, it's about wins and losses. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I, I, I sort of relate that to uh, Leeds' strategy and, and potentially even uh, Manchester City today, even though we'll, we'll show you that Manchester City did end up winning, the fact that, that you put all of your, your cards, giving the youngsters a chance but it's still the FA Cup and the big sides. When you're a holder, when you're a holder of the FA Cup, there's a difference. Leeds, mm. probably Bielsa, maybe he doesn't put as much importance. Does he like to lose? No, he doesn't. But you're the FA Cup holders. And yeah. I was surprised at the setup. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's kind of, it, that really highlights where Arsenal's at at the moment. I don't think they really. What I'm trying to say with that is they don't really understand their place in the game at the moment for some reason. And like you say, they are the holders. And Darren said it before, when you're expected to win, not just the game, but the whole cup, um, 
you've, you've got to go out there and, and, and put a few goals away in the first half, first, you know, first 20 minutes if you can to set the tone. Otherwise, you see, I mean, Southampton are no mugs, obviously, but... No, um, they're not. The you know, not. holder is expected to, to go and, and defend that title with everything you've got. And I think that's the bit that Arsenal are missing from a, just from a conceptual point of view. Yeah, and what, 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 what's your take on that, Darren, in terms of was it a surprise or was it not a surprise given the up-and-down form of Arsenal? I mean, Southampton at home are quite good. They do have Danny Ings up front. They do have Theo Walcott. They do have the speed of Shea Adams. Uh, but Arsenal are the holders, and you expected at least uh, for them to score, not score, and they've had struggled. They're up and down with scoring lately. Yeah, for me, I think he should have played his strongest team, especially as the holders. Um, I just think when, when, you're, when you are the holders, like you said, of, of the cup, of the FA Cup, it's really important to defend that title and selecting a weaker side uh, just won't help you one. And I can understand maybe in the in the League Cup, you know, giving, giving younger players a chance. But if you're the holders, the FA Cup has more status. And one in the FA Cup can save your job. And mm-hmm. if he does languish in 15th, 16th place with Arsenal and ended up one in the FA Cup, then your job can be saved. But obviously, the manager's priorities is the league and finishing high up the table as possible. Maybe these managers who are foreign don't appreciate the FA Cup as much. But in saying that, Arteta did play in England for years with mm-hmm. Everton and Arsenal, so he does have a good understanding of it. Um, so my only conclusion is that he must just have his main focus is on the league, finishing up the table as high as possible, and then giving the younger players a chance in the cup. Um, but it certainly won't help his team morale getting beat by Southampton, uh, who have Danny Ings, who is, has been on fire this season, and it's great to see because um, he has that potential. He has tremendous potential, and uh, you know I was worried because when he had that really bad knee injury, and they, you know, he had the operation, he came back uh, what maybe about four weeks later, if that, and he's he hasn't really shown any signs of concern and stability over the knee. Um, it is the last thing about the game is I felt bad for Arsenal because the way they lost was Gabriel scored an own goal in the twenty fourth minute, and. Uh, you don't want to lose, like Mike said, but especially as holders, but you don't want to lose to an own goal. So, you know, that's it for the the, the Southampton Arsenal game. But um, I actually like Southampton. I think Southampton currently is sitting in 10th place. Arsenal right behind them in 11th and my side right behind them in 12th, Leeds United. The next game was Barnsley versus Norwich. It was a 1-0 surprise. I actually surprised. Uh, I actually picked Norwich to win this one. And uh, Norwich had 71% possession. It's not the same Norwich that we've seen in previous years up front. They don't have um, the same goal-scoring record up front. But Barnsley, 12 shots on goal, 10 on target. Callum Styles wrapping it up in the 56th minute. Barnsley wins 1-0. Um, I think they've really done remember um, last year Norwich um, yeah it was a bad year for them but two years removed they had Timu up front that was scoring goals right and left and uh, he's no longer there they've got uh, Jordan Hugill up front um, and Barnsley move on the next game after that was Brighton they won 2-1 at hosts hosting Blackpool and um, Brighton's one of those sides that they've got up front Brighton when they're healthy they've got Danny Welbeck when he's healthy they've got Adam Lana when he's healthy and they've got Neil Morpé they just beat Leeds they uh, have have pulled off some upsets so far for this season Uh, and Blackpool got their goal in the... They had tied it up just before halftime with Gary Medine. So if you remember the Scottish striker, Gary Medine, uh, really good in the Scottish leagues, I should say. Um, Brighton won that 65% possession. They win that one. Millwall were at home to uh, Bristol City. 
Um, Millwall, historically, a tough side to play against, especially when they're playing at home. And Leeds have had some horrible uh, luck uh, playing away at Millwall. Millwall got drubbed 3-0 by Bristol City. Naxi Wells uh, made it 2-0 in the 58th minute. And uh, Antoine Semenyo tied it up in the 72nd minute. Some of these names, like you think about Naxi Wells, uh, and he's played with so many different sides. Still, um, even though Bristol City are not in the EPL, um, he's still proven a, a pretty good goal scorer. So Bristol City go on to the next round. Next tie was Sheffield United and the Blades, and I want to ask you about Sheffield United in a second. They won 2-1 in a close game at home to Plymouth Argyle. Now, um, as of two games ago, two, if you remove themselves two games ago, they w- hadn't won a single game for the entire English Premier League season. Now there are 19 games in. They've won one EPL game. They remain rooted at the bottom of the division. They started Billy Sharp and Rian Brewster to rest David McGoldrick and uh, Ollie McBurk. What is the biggest reason why a club like Sheffield United that the last two years, especially last year, at the beginning of the season, was showing an amazing run of form where at one point they were in eighth place? Um, what is it? What has it been, do you think? And I'll start off with... You, Darren, on that. What What is holding up Sheffield United and the Blades? Do you think finally Chris Wilder can start going on the run with this side? Or do you think at the back they don't have enough? Or, or is it the lack of goals, which they're really not scoring many goals in, in, in season so far? I think it's across the board with Sheffield United. Um, they just don't have the quality of the other teams. Um, you could talk about the formations and... And I've been, I've been impressed by the 3-5-2, um, especially at the beginning of the season. They look really well organised. Um, but at the end of the day, you're competing against teams who just have more money financially to spend. And as good as these players are um, in, in maybe the championship, I think when you come to the Premier League, it's a different ball game. Um, so I just don't think they have the strength and depth to compete with... Like the players that you named just now, for example, True. I just don't think they have, you can't compete with, I don't know, an Everton who buy James Rodriguez. <laughs> um, but in saying that, for example, Leeds have came up and they don't maybe have the money um, that the bigger teams have. And they've kind of competed with their outlandish style of play. So unless you have something really exceptional, and really unique and different, like a Leeds, they beat these teams. If you don't have the financial muscle, then you're going to struggle. Do you do you agree with that assessment, Mike? In terms of the struggles, Darren's yeah. take on that. I, think so. I, I, I agree mean, overall. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We all know the Premier League is ruthless, and if you just start dropping a little bit of form, particularly if you're a smaller side, without the with the, super, the superstars and the big budgets. You know, it, it can go down very quickly, and that's it's just what's happened to Sheffield, unfortunately. Um, you know, one of the oldest clubs in football history, and um, sure. everyone was delighted they came up, of course, and they ran a form in the championship to get there. And, you know, it's a real pity. It'd be great to see them continue on. Um, but like you said, I mean, the, di- the difference at Leeds is Bielsa, for mine, you know, one of the greatest minds in football, in modern football, and he's unleashed that on these super kids. Unfortunately, Sheffield... Uh, don't seem to have that, um, and they're just getting pummeled every week, and it just becomes a compounding thing. It doesn't nothing. Some in some cases, it's just they're just being beaten down they, so far. They've kind of lost their way in, you know, the structures are there. They're trying. You can see they're really frustrated. It's just not happening. Yeah, and I think there are tough sides to play against, with the exception of the top six when they play them. But they're not an easy side. They're they're, they're fairly well organised, but. Earlier in the season, I think they weren't getting even a point because they just weren't scoring goals up front. I think it was the first, what was it, the first six games they had scored maybe three or four goals in the first six games. Just not good enough. Um, 
I do like Rian Brewster. I think that he's a talented striker. However, I'm not sure Sheffield United was the best place for him, to be honest with you. Um, maybe he should have gone on loan to another side. I know his career so far, he spent at Swansea and then uh, over at Liverpool. But do you think it was right, Darren, for him to go uh, to, to move to Sheffield United? Do you think he thought he would get more game time than he currently is getting? Yeah, I think that would have been his his motivation, coming to a so-called lesser team, you know, especially after Liverpool, thinking as a player that he's going to get more game time. Um, so from that point of view, um, it, it would be a good move. But when you're part of a team that's relegated, it never looks good on you as the individual player. That's if, obviously, Sheffield United do get relegated. Um, so I don't think it's a it's a really bad option for a player to have that in his mind to, to go to a team where he, he might play more. Um, if he hasn't done that, then then that's going to be a nightmare for him. But if he has and he's playing games and he's getting experience, in another two years, he'll look back in this moment and and realise how much he's grown. So him sitting on a bench at a, at a different side, maybe at a higher level, um, isn't going to help him. This experience, even though they're struggling right now, um, will stand him in good stead for, for years to come. Yeah, because I think he's a great finisher of, of uh, taking his chances. Um, let's move on because we've got a few games coming up uh, to finish off. On Saturday, we had Swansea City thumping Nottingham Forest 5-1. Matt Grimes, Liam Cullum, both with braces. Oliver Cooper scoring in the 84th minute. And one of my faves from Nottingham Forest got their consolation goal in the 56th minute, and that was Anthony Knockhart. And uh, I've always found him exciting to watch. But Nottingham Forest, uh, a really bad result. West Ham were 4-0 uh, winners at home to Doncaster. Not a surprise there. West Ham, we just mentioned before about being on a good run of form. And... Uh, I think, Mike, you said about them being quite a sort of a, a steely side and well-organised. Uh, and I think David Moyes, um, he's actually shown that maybe Manchester United was an aberration and uh, that he is a good manager. Um, Pablo Fornell scored in the second minute, and you mentioned about the importance of starting off the games really well in the second minute. You had Yamalenko in the 32nd minute, an own goal by Adi Butler in the 52nd minute, and then uh, Afolo Yan in the 78th minute. They fielded a side West Ham that wasn't a full-strength side, but that was enough to beat Doncaster Rovers. The last game on a Saturday, it looked like, was Cheltenham Town, which was one of the games that I watched and it was a big surprise because Cheltenham Town at halftime was nil-nil against Manchester City. And did I don't know if you either of you saw the game, but Cheltenham took literally the lead in the 59th minute from a throw-in, a really long throw into the box, and Alfie May converts that, and the shock is on, and you're thinking, wait a second, did you really mean to change up the squad talking about Pep Guardiola uh, but in the last 10 minutes they scored three goals so Foden, Gabriel Jesus and Ferran Torres wrap up the victory for Manchester City but it does go to show you that sometimes you're resting your experience you're resting Sterling you don't play some of the guys that you normally would start out you keep them on the bench and you go with the youngsters in defence and made some changes in midfield, almost backs fires on them. Did you any of you see the game? Any thoughts on Manchester City tweaking things like some of the other sides have done? Yeah, I'll just go quickly and then I'll hand over to Darren. I think that I think if that I was only, only going to say it really proves Darren's point from earlier that if you're the big side, you should really have put them away early. Yep. Um, 
it gives the other team, the smaller teams who are playing for, they've got nothing to lose. It gives them confidence in the self-belief that, you know, we can pinch one here. And then all of a sudden you put one in the back of the net and then the, the, the belief starts to double and you really think you're, you're, you know, you're away. I mean, obviously a team like City is just, you know, if it was against a lesser top four club, if that makes sense, they may have gotten away with one there. But the, the pure, you know, power that is City over around them. But that was my take on it. It just really highlighted what Darren said before. Yeah, and I think um, not only the importance of putting out, you know, in the first half, trying to get things settled and taking that pressure off, but um, Zach Steffen in goal for City. I've never seen him play before. Taylor Harwood Bellis uh, was also on and Thomas Doyle. So they started... On the bench, Sterling, Gundogan and Silva, they came on as subs in the second half. They managed to save the embarrassment for Pep Guardiola and they move on. And I think they will be there all the way, I think, till the end. I think City right now, if they field a strong side, they're going to be tough to beat in the cup. Sunday's games, we started off with Chelsea, another strong cup side, I think. Chelsea should not be ignored in the cup. I think Frank Lampard's side is one to watch in the cup. A hat-trick by one of my favourite strikers, Tammy Abraham. He's either on or he's really poor. And uh, he had a great game. They, at 2-1 two, two at half-time, I was getting a bit nervous because Luton Town had made it 2 when They'd pulled a goal back. Tammy scoring the 11th and the 17th minute. And in the 30th minute, Jordan Clark made it 2-1 for Luton Town. They were trailing Luton Town, I should say, at half-time. Uh, 15 shots on goal, seven on target for Chelsea, only three on target for Luton Town. We're not going to spend much time talking about that, ex with the exception of where does Frank Lampard go right now? He's under scrutiny with the board at Chelsea. They were looking good several games ago. They had more fluidity up front when they had the partnership with not only Abraham, but Ziach and Varner, I don't see Varner and Ziach clicking as much lately. Darren, your take on Chelsea, and then I'll and then we'll flip it to Mike. I've been I've been excited by Chelsea when Lampard came on. I'm a huge uh, fan of Lampard when he was a Me player. Too. I love him and. And I like that he, he understands Chelsea. He knows what Chelsea is about. And I like the fact that he was giving young English guys a chance. Um, I think Mason Mount has been fantastic. Oh, super. Um, but in saying that, it's a lot of new players. It's a real changing of the guard for Chelsea. And change of manager, lots of new players. Zayek, Werner. It's going to take time for these players to settle on. So from from my point of view, I'd love to see Lampard uh, not get sacked. I, I, I wouldn't like to see that. I think I think there's good potential there. I would like to see him get through this season and then have a good preseason next year and give it a proper crack at trying to win the Premier League. But right now, with the transitions that's happening, it's just there's so much going on. Uh, Werner hasn't had a target yet. He's had a target, but he's not scoring any goals. But I think once you get him going, he'll be fine. Uh, Ziyech is is amazing. Um, for Ajax, he was outstanding. Uh, it's wow. his first season. Abraham, again, as you say, David, he's hot and cold. When he's on, he's really on. Um, and when he's off, he misses from a yard out. So, you know, it's yeah, one of those he's things. got that kind of... Like he's got that like awkward physique. Um is he a drogba? No, no, not not yet. Will he ever be a drogba? We don't know yet. But if he can fulfill his potential up front, then you've really got half a chance. Um, but definitely I'd like to see Lampard not get sacked and I'd like to see him come on next season and and see what he can do. Great. Right. Well, thanks for that. Um Mike, quick quick take. We only we've got a Still a bunch of games to go, but qu quick take on Chelsea and, and what you think is needed to regain the form that they had about six or seven games ago. They went on that strong run where everything was clicking. And even if Werner wasn't scoring, he was providing the assists. Yeah. What is it they've been doing in the last couple of games that maybe they need to maybe correct? Yeah, I think um, 
like you, as Darren said, a, a super, super squad, really exciting squad. Um, for mine, one of the picks of the season and where they were going to go. Um, it loads me to say both my sons follow Chelsea with their, with their dad as an Arsenal fan. It's not really that great. Um, but I think they're just, again, you know, they're just not scoring some of the chances they could have put away. And that makes all the difference between falling back on your, your training, falling back on the manager's plan, and then you miss a couple of easy ones and you, and you lose, and your confidence in the system starts to go a little bit. As Darren said, new squad, a lot of changes. Just needs to be more consistency, and I'd love to see Lampard, Lampard stay. I think he's, he's one of the best people in football. Yeah, and even being a Leeds fan, I have to agree with that. We didn't like him uh, when they knocked us out in the playoff, um, especially when he was doing the uh, the sign after they beat Leeds. But fantastic player. One of the best signings for the season, I thought, was bringing in Mendy. And I think he was an absolute revelation because in the first few games, they were leaking too many goals at the back no command the previous keeper, no command of the defence. Mendy made the big difference when he came in. The first five games really had that good communication with the back four. So let's think, let's hope that Chelsea could rediscover the form. And right now, let's move on to Brentford against Leicester City. Leicester City won 3-1 away. Leicester City's another side we need to spend just a little time talking about. They've got they've got scorers in this game. They've got uh, Tealman's made it two 0 Madison wrapped it up, make it three um, one. They had sixty one percent possession in the game. I like Leicester City. They um, destroyed Leeds not on possession. They never usually dominate possession, but they're great on the counter attack, and I think they've got good breakaway speed. Um, I like Harvey Barnes, I like Tealmans, I like James Madison, and of course, Jamie Vardy sat out. I didn't see the injury list. I don't know if he was missing intentionally or he's injured, uh, but no Jamie Vardy. What's your take, quick take on maybe a, a, a sentence or two on Leicester City? What's been the highlight for you so far with Leicester City? And I'll go with Mike first and then Darren. I think Leicester City, um, great squad. They know their game. They know their capabilities. They play with. They play to that capability. Um, they're tough. They're team focused. They don't take credit. You know, they give all the credit to their to their colleagues and their coach and their and their supporters. Um, you see the great interview with Madison after that game. Yeah. Just highlights where their mindset's at. We just want to get better. We want to study, and we want to learn how to play better together. And I think they've got a great uh, manager in Brendan Rodgers, and I think he's perfect fit for Leicester City. Would you agree on that assessment, Darren? Yeah, definitely. I'm a huge Brendan Rodgers fan. Um, I'm a huge Leicester fan. I really enjoy watching them. It's a different style of play from the team that won the league under Ranieri. And Madison has been a revelation. I think he's a similar player to Fernandez. You know, he's starting to to pick up the mantle and, and be the talisman for Leicester. Yeah, um, the vision, the movement, uh, everything, yep. Beautiful, like really technically sound, uh, lovely striker of the ball with both feet. Um, he pulls the strings. The team work very hard off the ball, like even though they're technically great, their work rate is fantastic. And with Vardy, you, you've always got goals. You, you're guaranteed goals. He, he's like a killer. He, he Once he has a sniff of the goal, like he's, he hits it. He's, he doesn't mess about. He's like a throwback centre forward. And I really enjoy that. Um, Tillemans, again, technically sound, yeah. physically strong. Um, they've just, they've, they've brought the, the style of play to a more modern uh, a way of playing. They've brought Leicester up until, it, it feels as if Rodgers has taken them towards a more modern um, successful European side, you know that's the way it looks. Rather than just a one-off kind of long ball Leicester team, they're they're advancing. Yeah, and it, and it does for some reason. It reminds me of the SAS partnership that he had under Liverpool, uh, that free-flowing uh, counter-attacking side, and uh, yeah, Jamie Vardy, 
just a killer, killer, love him. Next game was Fulham, and they were at home to Burnley. And Burnley actually, the last few games uh, have started to show like, that maybe they've started to turn the corner slightly. And they've got on the bench, you know, uh, Chris Woods didn't start. They put Jay Rodriguez up front. I don't believe Chris Woods started. I didn't see this one game. I only saw the replays. But Jay Rodriguez with a brace in the 31st and 71st minute with a penalty. And Kevin Long in the 81st minute wrapped up. Um, Mitrovic started for Fulham. Now, Mitrovic, if you look at him two seasons prior, big goal scorer, big goal scoring threat, was out for some time, did not finish up, was out with an injury, didn't finish up healthy at the end of last season, missed the first several games. He hasn't been starting for Fulham. Um, I'm surprised they started Mitrovic, but they wanted to probably get him some game time in there. I think it cost Fulham. Uh, but Burnley is, even though Burnley and Fulham are at the bottom four right now, um, I think Burnley is one of those sides that I think can move up in the table. We're not going to spend too much time on that. I want to get to the game that we really want to talk about, and that's Manchester United, Liverpool. I thought it was a fantastic game of football. It was a good advertisement for football. Great attacking, free-flowing football. Maybe some mistakes at the back on both. Um, Mason Greenwood um, equalising. Mo Salah had put Liverpool up in the 18th minute. Mason Greenwood with a fine strike. I think, actually, with all the goals, would you, do you agree, guys? All the goals scored were well-taken goals. There was no gimmies in that game. I thought Mason Greenwood's tucked into the left corner was a great strike. Marcus Rashford had put up Man U 2-1 in the 48th minute at the beginning of the second half. Salah with his brace in the 58th minute. And what do you think about that beautiful free kick from Bruno Fernandes? It wasn't maybe Ronaldo-esque. It didn't have that as great a dip. But right in the corner, beautifully taken. I think Liverpool um, starting Mane on the bench. I didn't agree with it. Um, I would have put Mane in, but that's me. I wouldn't have put Mane on the bench. Um, let's start off with Darren. We'll reverse it. And let's start off with you, Darren, and get your take on Manchester United, Liverpool. What were you thinking about the game and the highlights and where Liverpool need to go from now. Yeah, look, uh, Fernandez again, stepping up to the plate. Um, you've got Greenwood, Rashford and Salah, and you've got the players who you would expect in these big games to come to the fore, uh, and they did with the goals. Um, I agree, I would have started Manny. Um, I think Manny's a world-class player. I think he's underrated um, by a lot of people. I don't think he gets the credit that he deserves. Um, sure. Probably Salah takes the lamp line light from him a lot of the times. Um, but Man United look good. Um, I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy with them. And it's been a long time since I've said that as a, as a fan. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been a long time coming. Uh, since Ferguson, we really haven't been... This is the best we've been since Ferguson. And that's been a long time. Um, with Liverpool... There's cracks. There's definitely cracks. Without Van Dijk, they're not the same. Uh, without Jota, they, they, they're not the same attacking-wise. Um, so if there's going to be a changing of the guard, then this could be the time. Because if you let Liverpool win the league this year again, and that, that could start a huge downfall of Man United, and we don't want that. So if there's a time to strike and a time to get ahead of them, then now's the time. Now's the time you take advantage of it. If Man United won the league this year, um, it will be a fantastic achievement. It really, really will, especially after Liverpool being so successful um, with the Champions League and the Premier League. Yeah, Mike, your take on that, and great points by Darren. Your take on the game, first of all, and then also um, Liverpool and, and, yeah. and, and Manchester United's position right now and... and where do you see them maybe in the rest of the season? 
Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I've really enjoyed watching Manchester United between Ferguson and now. To me, as an Arsenal fan, that's been the best period of this club by a long way. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, no, obviously being facetious to give give a bit of stick to Darren there, but yeah, clearly, <laughs> yeah, um, this is the best they've been since Ferguson in terms of just the sheer, you know, it's the one, it's the one nil wins when they're winning, when they're doing them United, you know, they're, they're on their way because, you know, they're playing this style that they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting and then they're scoring or oh, it's a free, today was a bit more free flowing, but they're not losing. Um, I mean, the thing with Liverpool, obviously Fernandez and the goals were all through the Fernandez goal, world class. Um, and, and you can't take that away from, you know, the great player that he is. Uh, the thing with Liverpool, I, I was thinking about this, is with Salah, you've either got him scoring goals or you've got nothing. If you watch him play, he doesn't do a lot of work off the ball. He doesn't do a lot of much else for his teammates other than want to receive the ball, cut in and score. And I think yep. that's a bit of a problem that Liverpool have. And if you're not bringing Mane in, who's a hard worker, you know, can score freakish goals, he's a great passer, there's a bit of disconnect there and they've got to, they've got to fix that. Um, I, 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 I couldn't that agree well. more. Couldn't agree more. Um, I think the selfish nature, I don't mean to be too critical of Salah, but I, I view him as more of a selfish player. Me, 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 me. And sometimes you could see the petulance that why did you not pass it to me? Even if they scored, he looks like mm. I should have scored that. I was available. I'm mad. And the petulance There's to me, there. I think so was David Mane would be better off. Yeah. There's so many instances where I've seen uh, a player at a better position and it's usually Mane and Salah doesn't pass it. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and, but also he's, I want that in my striker. I want my striker to be really selfish. And when he doesn't score, I actually want him to be to be unhappy that he hasn't been the one that scored. I don't mind that at all as a striker. I, I, I like that. I enjoy that. But at times he should pass it without a doubt. Good, good, good. So let's see, guys. Uh, you know, we'd like to see Liverpool go on a, on a, a better run of form. Good luck to Manchester United. Of course, being a Leeds fan, I don't like either either side. But I have to say that this is the best, other than that 10-game unbeaten run when Solskjaer first took over. But I think it's a different side, and Bruno Fernandes has made a huge difference. Liverpool, at the beginning of the season, I did one of the recaps of the week. I think it was like week, maybe week four or week five or something like that. Liverpool at the time were missing 10, 10 players to injury. And it wasn't just Van Dijk at the time. It was like Milner, Oxlade, Chamberlain, and you just went through and it was Alexander Arnold and, and Andy Robertson and blah, blah, blah. So I think ever since then they've struggled. They did a good job at getting back into first place for a while. And then now a bit of a free fall, but it's the back at the back. I don't see. So I think, when they get some of those healthy bodies back other than Van Dijk, I think they'll start to creep up the table. But I just don't see them having enough to win. But this is a season that's surprised so far. So we could sit here and say, I'll put a thousand pounds that Liverpool doesn't win. And then they could go on a run and win the next 15 games. Last game today was Everton. And they were playing host to Sheffield Wednesday. Everton, Everton's another one of those sides that they've got Calvert-Lewin, a dominant striker in form. He scored first in the 29th minute. You've got uh, Richarlson, who's a pretty good scorer, the Brazilian. And uh, Yaramina, he wrapped up three points and they won 3-0. Everton's one of those sides, just like Southampton, where one week or Aston Villa, one week they looked great and then they could get demolished 5-2. So which side is going to show up? Um, Jaimes Rodriguez, to me, is a fantastic player, but he's been inconsistent for Everton. Uh, Sigurdsson, when he's on, I think he pulls the strings. I think he's got a good, he's, he's got good eye for distribution. 
and they started Robin Olsen, which I was surprised in goal. Everton, a top six side, not a top six side. What do you think? Uh, I, I don't think they'll make a top six. Um, but I have been impressed by Ancelotti and Rodriguez. And when you bring uh, characters like that into the club, um, it again, it lifts them. And it brings them into a more modern era. Um, you've got like Dancelotti's won Champions League, Rodriguez Champions League. Um, so when you have players like that who come into a club, everyone else is forced to lift their game because they're bringing something from a European mainland, uh, a higher quality of coaching, a higher quality of play that the other players have to respond to. Um, but at the same time, for James Rodriguez, it's a Premier League and it takes time to adapt. No matter how good you are, it's a different style of play. There's less space, there's less time uh, than there is in Spain. So um, I don't think we'll be top six, but what I've been impressed by by their the change that's happened there. Yeah, and I think Alex Iwobi, um, who happens to be uh, my best friend in England, um, it's his uh, wife's... Uh, biological cousin. So Alex is, uh, it's converted, it's converted uh, my uh, my best friend's son, who was a Leeds United supporter. He, he then converted to being an Arsenal supporter. He hasn't switched to Everton yet, but he still follows Alex Awobi. But they are sitting currently in sixth place, They've had 10 wins in the first 17 games. And remember, they've got two games in hand. So if they win both of those, they could move up and be right joint second with Manchester City on point. So don't rule out Everton. The way it's ending up, guys, is right now Manchester United in first place on 40 points. Manchester City, 38 points in second game in hand. Leicester City in third Played 19, 20, uh, sorry, 35 points. Uh, you've got Liverpool in fourth. You've got Tottenham in fifth and Everton in sixth. In the bottom three, Sheffield United on five points. Probably bang on to go uh, get relegated. West Brom on 11 points and Fulham on 12 points. Thank you guys for uh, giving your expert opinions. We appreciate it. And um, let's look and see what happens for the rest of the campaign. We'd love to have you back on the show and appreciate you taking time out. Enjoy Aussie Day tomorrow. You'll probably have a lot better weather than where I'm at in North Carolina. What's the weather like in, uh, in Melbourne today? Oh, it's roasting. Yeah, the weather's been really warm the last few days. Uh, we played a preseason game on Saturday and... It was 30 degrees and I was struggling because where I'm from in the in, around Balamina, as you know, David, you do not get that uh, nice of weather. Um, so it's been good. And I just want to say just for Mike, um, there's an Arsenal supporters group uh, down in Geelong and they, they deal with men who are struggling with uh, their mental health because of Arsenal's performance. So. <laughs> David and Mike, if you just if you want to get in touch, I'll, I'm happy to send you the number. You know, like be, stay strong. It's going to be all right. Oh man, I'll wait for some payback. Thanks, Don't worry. Don't worry. Thanks, mate. I mean, look, the, the good thing is I know you. I know you. You've got the knowledge there to support me because you've been through it for the last twelve years. So. <laughs> <laughs> true. True. I'll hang on to uh, the one nil win when we had Jermaine Beckford and knocked you out. So I'm hanging <laughs> to that. I'm hanging to right. that. Well, thanks, guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You're just getting started there in uh, sunny Melbourne. And uh, I'm hoping that the Aussie Open still goes ahead. But um, it, it it's a bit doubtful now. I'm not sure which direction that they take the uh, the Aussie Open in because you've got all these quarantines and players quarantine and players not being able to leave their hotel rooms. So uh, interesting time in Melbourne with the Aussie Open coming up. Yeah. We'll catch you soon, guys. 
Have a great okay. one. Do you want to pop, pop it? Uh, just basically say something about the Aussie Open, Mike, before we leave and say goodbye to the viewers. Oh, look, I mean, you know, as a Mel Mel Melbourneian, you know, it's one of the best, one of the pinnacle events every year. It's a real shame to not see it already in completion now. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know where, where you go with, with, with players who can't train, how they can go and perform. I'm not sure. Uh, it's a difficult one. Well, I just want to say uh, to everyone in Melbourne and Australia overall, um, you know, just wishing everybody uh, to stay healthy, stay safe. And uh, listen, sport gives us plenty of joy, but there is nothing without health. So uh, have a wonderful, healthy and enjoyable and a productive week, guys. Thanks for coming. Thanks, uh, to the, Thanks, Mike. We'll see you soon. Cheers, guys. See you. see you, guys.